clap for Will. He does a great job. So just before we get started, just catching you up in case you didn't notice, all three modulars got moved this week to their, to their new homes. We're super excited about that. Yeah. Um, if you're warm in here today, the air conditioner is on the fritz. So that is not construction related. It's just incredibly bad timing. So uh, we'll, we'll pray that it's just, it's old. You know, we've been here 20 years, if you can believe that. So things are starting to age out. I'm, I'm starting to age out a little bit myself, but um, lots going on, lots going on. We're so excited for what continues to happen here and what God's doing. And we are glad you're here and that you're a part of it, whether you're in the room or whether you're joining us online or whether you're at York Haven. Today is Pastor Carl George's first day as the new pastor at York Haven. We're super excited for them, for him, for his family. They had all kinds of technical difficulties at York Haven today. You know, we were like, we're all pumped for him to come. And they, Aaron did a great job doing the stage and like the soundboard went down. I don't know if they fixed it or not, but they'll get through. But big doings, good stuff going on over over the time and over the years here. So over over my time here, I feel like sometimes I'm asked to speak about some really hard things. Like, I don't know really hard things. And I'm not the only one that feels like that. That's the, the lot of a pastor, right? Sometimes you got to talk about some really hard things. But when it's, when it's me, when it's you, you, you feel the weight of that. It's like, oh, I don't really want to talk about this today. But today is different. I'm really excited about the message for today. The topic for today is Jesus, friend of sinners. And that's something I can swing in the ham again. Jesus is a friend of sinners. I bet you you can too, right? What would we do if Jesus were not a friend of sinners? So I hope the message today is really encouraging for you. I hope it's uplifting for you. And you leave here reminded that you have a friend that is perfect and constant, and sticks closer than a brother, no matter what. Today we're going to take a look, uh, a quick look, at some of the, what you would consider some of the main characters, really famous people in the Bible. These were people who were flawed, they were imperfect, they made bad decisions, they made mistakes, and yet God used them to change the course of their history and the course of the kingdom. These were people who time and again messed up. And they were probably people who said to themselves things that I think we often say to ourselves, well, that's done it. I've crossed the line for the final time. And there is no way that Jesus could still want to call me his friend. I think that once or twice a week. <laughs> I bet you you think it time from time to time as well. But I get so tired of saying that to myself. Do you get tired of saying that to yourself? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to begin by reading a short section of scripture together out of the book of Matthew. It's Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 to 13. And it says, later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? These were the religious people, mind you, asking the question. When Jesus heard this, he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. 
So before we dive in, I would love to take just a second and pray, okay? Heavenly Father, um, my gratefulness for your friendship was renewed the past several weeks as I prepared for this message because I know me and you know me even better. Yet still you are my friend. Lord, help us to never lose sight of that. Help us to never stop being grateful for what your love and your friendship means in our lives. We worship a God who is our Savior and who is our friend. May we spend the rest of our lives getting our heads and hearts around that. In your name, amen. So as I said, I want to quickly take a look at some of the more famous characters in the Bible, people that you've probably heard about, people whom Jesus considered his friends, people who were messed up, and people Jesus used to change the course of history. So first of all, we have Moses. Moses was a murderer and had a temper. Can you imagine being up on a mountain, being given the Ten Commandments written by the hand of God? Come down off the mountain, see the people messing up, and you're so mad, you smash them. Those were written by God's hand, and you lose your temper and smash them. Moses had a temper. His temper caused him to murder an Egyptian. But God used that hot-tempered man to lead his people, the Israelites, out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Moses. Then we have David. David was an adulterer, a murderer, and a schemer. Not only did he morally mess up with Bathsheba, but he also schemed with Bathsheba's husband to cover it up. He schemed against Bathsheba's husband. Uriah was his name. He was a general in David's army. And David saw to it that he would be killed in battle so that he would be free to have Bathsheba as his wife. He really messed up. Now I want to note here that David did this, this incident in David's life, long after God had placed a call on his life. When this happened, David had been walking with God for a long time. He had known God since he was that little shepherd boy tending his father's sheep out in the field. David wrote many of the Psalms we still read today as that young child watching his father's sheep. God anoints him to be king. David is king. For, and then he has this crisis in his life. So if you don't hear anything else I say today, hear, hear this. If you've been walking with God for a long time and you really mess it up. You can define long time on your own terms, but you've been walking with God for some time and you fail it is not the end of God's being your friend. It is not the end of God's wanting to use you. He isn't done with you. He does not want to put you on a back shelf. That is what grace is for. That is what forgiveness is all about. Every time we ask God to forgive us for the latest thing, he is there as our constant forgiver and friend. Don't let your mistakes be your undoing. People may not forgive you, but God always will. God is never done with you, so don't be done with yourself and don't give up, whether you've messed up for the first time or the tenth time or the hundredth time. God is never ever done with you. Peter is our third person. Peter, we know most famously perhaps as the betrayer. He is the one who denied even knowing this Jesus man right before his crucifixion. 
and cussed about it. But Peter is the one that God used. He said, your name is Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. He was one of the great founding fathers of the New Testament age church. The betrayer, the one who denied he even knew Jesus. He went from Peter the betrayer to Peter the rock. Being a friend of Jesus does that. Then we have the woman at the well. The woman in Samaria that sat at the well that Jesus encountered one day. And it's kind of a long, longer-ish story. But this woman was, uh, had been married four times previously and was now living with her fifth partner. And Jesus knew it. He knew all about her. But Jesus looks at this woman who had, you know, wasn't like goal, stellar, moral life. It happens, but he knew all about her. And yet he said, I want you, woman who is now with your fifth partner, to go back and tell your neighbors about me. God wants to use you. Messed up as we are, God is never done with you. If he can use a Peter and a woman at the well and a David and a Moses, he can use us. Then we have Rahab. The old King James Version name for Rahab was a harlot. She was a prostitute. But God used her to change the course of Israelite history. And then there's Noah and Abraham and Jacob and Solomon and Doubting Thomas. All super flawed people who made mistakes over and over again. I'm sure there are others you could name because the Bible is loaded with flawed people who God used to change the course of history. Because the only one that ever walked the planet without flaw was Jesus himself. So we're all kind of in the same mistake ridden boat this morning together. But let's get back to our story in Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. He hated his past and his present. He had made some pretty poor choices in his life. But on the other hand, Matthew was a smart, educated man. He was talented in many ways. He had grown up Jewish, so he knew all the scriptures. He had everything it takes to be a, su a success story. But Matthew made bad choices. Those bad choices made him rich, but they cast a long, dark shadow. See, by choosing to become a tax collector, Matthew, who had grown up, was born Jewish, made a choice to turn his back on his Jewish community and side with the enemies of his people, the Romans. What would make somebody make a choice like that? Turn your back on your people, deny your heritage. Well, Matthew made those choices for money and influence. Money and influence. Some things never change, do they? How many good people over history have been undone by their pursuit of money and influence? But Jesus is a friend of sinners. Matthew's pursuit had a really high price. The Jewish community that he had been born into rejected him and come to hate him. They excommunicated him, and he was not even allowed to go into the synagogue anymore. He was an outcast, and even his family wanted nothing to do with him. His only option at this point in his life was to hang out with the other outcasts, the other tax collectors, the prostitutes, and others considered sinners by his Jewish community. I wonder if Matthew ever wondered the things I think we often wonder. If only I could go back in time. If only I could have said, I wish I had made a different choice. If only I would have. Those coulda, woulda, shouldas 
haunt us, don't they? We do this to ourselves. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. And I think sometimes those coulda, woulda, shouldas often haunted Matthew as well. But you can't go back and change the past. We can only go forward. But going forward for Matthew was painful in a lot of ways. He felt like he was in this huge life rut. There was nothing to look forward to. Nothing was ever going to change. Everything was always going to be just the way it was now. His, his relationship with his family and his Jewish community was never going to be restored. And there was really not much hope for him that things were ever going to be better or that he was ever going to change. Do you ever feel like that? Things are never going to get better. Things are always going to be the way they are now. And it's my fault because I screwed up yet again. You know where that's, those lines come from, right? They come from our enemy, the evil one, who's doing everything he can to destroy our usefulness for the kingdom. And if he can destroy your faith in the friendship and constant companionship, faithfulness, and forgiveness of God, the friend of sinners, he destroys your testimony and makes you unuseful for the kingdom. That's his goal. Don't believe those lies. They are lies. Satan is called, you know, name of Satan, father of lies. He uses it so well against us. We believe these things about ourselves and about the nature of God that are absolutely false. And it paralyzes us. And it stops our effectiveness right in its tracks. Don't listen to the lies. Well, all those things that we tell ourselves, you know, life is never going to be better, I've messed up too many, all those things could have been true about Matthew's life, except for Jesus, who's a friend of sinners. When Jesus entered Matthew's life, everything changed. And the same holds true today. When Jesus enters a life, everything changes. Because Jesus is a friend of sinners. So in the midst of these crowds, in the, in, in the context of the story that we read today, Jesus sees Matthew. But not just sees Matthew, his outer appearance. He sees what's inside Matthew. He sees the brokenness and the guilt of a man who, in an attempt to make his life successful, lost it. He wandered. I'm going to stop here just, just for a second. Have any of you ever heard the song 85 by Andy Grammer? This is not a Christian song. Sometimes I don't listen to all Christian radio. Anybody heard it? 85 by Andy Grammer? Okay. I just want to share a couple of the lines with you from that song because it keeps in, it's in keeping with this idea of, man, in our attempt to make our lives successful, sometimes we truly mess it up. So the chorus of the song goes like this. If I were Drew, I'd sing it for you. I ain't doing that. All right. I don't want to be 85 singing, oh no, I think I missed it. I was chasing money. I don't want to be 85 singing, oh no, I got a big house, but my heart is ugly. This was turning out to be Matthew's story. He made some really bad choices in pursuit of money and influence. And consequently, Matthew's heart was turning ugly. But Jesus looked at Matthew differently than the people around him did. He doesn't look at the greed within Matthew that made him turn against his own people in order to become rich. He doesn't look at the indifference and disrespect for God that Matthew had that made him betray both God and his Jewish heritage. When Jesus looked at Matthew, he saw a man who just lost his way. There are days you're standing in the bathroom mirror, going through the motions, at least I don't want to speak for you. I'm standing in the bathroom mirror, 
putting on the makeup, going through the motions, and you just feel like, I've lost my way. What is today, what am I going to do today that's going to make any bit of difference for anybody besides me? Man, I think I don't know. Maybe I'm projecting personal struggles with y'all, but I think we do, we lose our way. We get caught up in stuff. You know, the last message I did was on stuff and the pursuit of stuff. So easily we are, are distracted. But Jesus saw um, a man who had lost his family and his community because of greed. He saw a man who was broken and who was in need of forgiveness who was in need of acceptance, and who was in need of a friend. Jesus is a friend of sinners. And Jesus became one of Matthew's greatest friends. As we learned last week, one of the names of God is Rapha, or healer. Jesus heals in our scripture today, and in in there he compares himself to a doctor. He takes Matthew over the next few years while he was still on earth on this journey of healing. Their their time together will be therapy for Matthew that will help him overcome the trauma and the hurt of a past that he cannot undo. If you're sitting in a place of trauma and hurt from a past you cannot undo, Jesus is your greatest friend. He walks with you every step of your journey. He doesn't change the past, but he changes your present and he changes your future. He did it for Matthew and he can do it for you. When Jesus looks at Matthew, he sees enormous potential. When Jesus looks at you, he sees enormous potential. He sees a man in Matthew who is made in the image of his creator. When he looks at you, he sees someone who was made in the image of his creator. He looked at Matthew and saw a man with a lot of gifts and talents. He looks at you and he sees one who has a lot of gifts and talents. And so Jesus sees, forgives, heals, and befriends Matthew. And so Jesus sees, forgives, heals, and befriends us. Jesus did not change his past. He did not push the magic undo button, but he did change Matthew's future. Matthew went from tax collector to evangelist. So if there's any tax collectors in the room, I'm really sorry. He would... Every time we talk about this, it's an honorable profession now. Back in the day, it was not. So for Matthew to go to tax collector to evangelist was a change of heart that only God could make. This Matthew is the same person who wrote the gospel from which we read our scripture today. It's so easy to think, I'm of no use to God. I'm not the right kind of person. I don't have the talents, I don't have the skills, I don't have the gifts, and I certainly don't have the level of perfection somebody who's a friend of Jesus should probably have. That's not me. I have things that haunt me, things I can't undo, things I would give anything to undo, but I can't undo them. I have messed up relationships, I have messed up at work. I might have a criminal record. I have this problem with the truth. I have this problem with substance abuse. Go, what is it for you? Because we all have it. We all have one or two of these things that kind of seem to kind of be, I think the Bible refers to them as sins that so easily beset us. Things we seem to have to fight for a lifetime. Man, sometimes we conquer them and sometimes we never quite seem to get over the hump. That's true of all of us. It's true of every Bible character you want to name. And it's been true of every human being that's lived since then and is alive today. I wish I could change the past, but we cannot. I got involved with the wrong people, ended up in the wrong places. 
But do you realize that that's the kind of people Jesus specifically is looking for? When Jesus called his disciples, and we won't go through the list, every one of them was like, now why would Jesus pick him? He had no influence. He had no particular mental acuity. Jesus picked run-of-the-mill, everyday people who had lives filled with pasts that weren't stellar, that made mistakes, that would continue to make mistakes, and yet God used those 12 men to change the world. We are no different. When Jesus is our friend, he can use us to change the world. Let that sink in and get your head around that. We are not, we are not on a shelf. God is not done with us. He's not, let's talk to the hand. He doesn't do that to us ever. You know, I, I, I don't, again, I, I had some counseling a while, a while back about a year ago. And we were just talking through some stuff, some mistakes, some concern, you know. We won't go into detail, but um, the counselor looked at me and she said, TJ, what would you say to somebody walking in your office who was telling you the story you're telling me? And I said, well, I would tell them that that's what grace is for. I would tell them this is exactly the reason Jesus died on the cross because we can never earn our way to heaven. We can never live up to the perfect standard that God sets for us. And I you know, went down. She goes, it's a good answer. Why don't you believe it's true for you? And I said, I don't know. Why do we do that? We believe it's true for everybody else. But for some reason, we believe the lies that come from the father of lies and think, nope, this time I went one step too far. This time I went one step beyond grace. It is never, ever true. Jesus forgives. He loves. He heals. He sees And he wants to use you from this day forward to change the kingdom. Jesus can use me and he can use you no matter your mistakes, no matter your past, no matter the mess you've made of your life. And sometimes I think he uses it not in spite of those things, but because of those things. When we've lived through some horrible thing or some embarrassed thing that's embarrassing to us, you have the ear of somebody walking the same, in the same shoes, don't you? Because you've been there. You know what it's like. So when Jesus, one of Jesus' names is also Redeemer, inherent in that name is the fact that something bad has happened or there would be nothing to redeem. You don't have to redeem a good situation or a good circumstance. Jesus redeems what is the most broken, most ugly, most difficult part of ourselves. And he has this amazing way of turning it on its head and using it for his glory and his kingdom. If you will just get over yourself, accept the forgiveness that God, he's he's standing there waiting, waiting. He says, I love you. I love you. I know what you did. I know why you did it. You might not even know why you did. I know why you did it. And I love you. Come back. Come back. Accept the grace, accept the forgiveness, and accept the friendship I so desperately want to give you. He never changes. We sang about it so many times this morning. So I want to, cha- I want to challenge you today to do one thing. After hearing the story of Matthew, understanding how Jesus saw Matthew as a man who was broken and marred and haunted by his past, and he turned that on his head through the gift of friendship, be a friend to somebody. We turn our backs pretty easily on people, don't we? You know, I have, I have this tat- tattoo on my arm. It says, reflect Jesus and extend grace. Now, you would think when somebody looks at that, I don't know, 15, 20 times a day, you might want to do that. But sometimes I don't. Sometimes the thing I just said really was not a reflection of Jesus. Sometimes the thought I just had was really not an extension of grace. 
Jesus says, and he never lies, that he is still my friend. You be that friend to somebody along the way who needs to know what friendship with Jesus is all about. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for grace and your friendship. Help us to be a friend to somebody in need today. In your name, amen.